Small setback. Small setback. But this is still going to be the greatest camping trip ever. Cousin, wake up and smell the propane. We're trapped and we haven't even left the apartment yet. I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a fuddy duddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking notes. Welcome to the Sitcom Study, the podcast where we contemplate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. Amy, what kind of TV episodes are we talking about today? We're going camping. Yeah, it is a camping trip. Again, another trope with a lot to choose from, right? A long list of TV sitcoms that have camping episodes. I think this is another trope that comes from real life where we're not dealing with what happens when you get amnesia because you bumped your head in the closet. This is a real thing that people do. So Amy, what is your relationship with camping? As I've said on the podcast, I grew up in Florida. So we would go camping at Disney, which like Fort Wilderness, there's a lodge there, but they also have campgrounds there. And so we would go and in Florida, you go camping in the winter because that's when it's not ungodly hot. So we would always go camping in like November or the beginning of December. And Every year that we went, it ended up being the coldest weekend of the year. And one year, we all got sinus infections, and my mom packed us all up in the middle of the night, and we left because we were all so sick. So we used to do that. And then when I was a little bit older, I would go camping with friends, and that was way more fun. Because the best part of camping is the like not the sleeping on the ground and in the tent part. It's the sitting around the campfire and talking and sure. looking at the fire and, you know, all the things that we can do now just by sitting at the fire pit in the backyard. Yeah, I went camping a lot too. You know, I wasn't super comfortable in the great outdoors, but I definitely always had friends that liked camping. I went to a Boy Scout camp for like a week that was all, you know, like a sleepaway thing with tents and stuff. And me and my friend Ellis were in the tent. We were like bunk mates, and our tent had daddy long legs all over it. And I was like, inside or outside? Yes, well, both, yeah. like inside too. And I could not abide that at that age. I was probably like 12 or something. And so I would lie in my little cock every night, scanning the interior of the tent with my flashlight. And waking Ellis up whenever I found a spider for him to kill. Now I do like camping. Like, I'm not super intense about it, but I absolutely would, you know, a couple of nights out on the old, you know, the old campgrounds with the, the fire and everything. Yeah. So what is our lineup? What are the shows we're so watching? So our lineup for this week, uh, we have The Partridge Family, Season 2, Episode 20, Help! Small Wonder, Season 1, Episode 15, Babes in the Woods. Then we're going to a personal favorite, Perfect Strangers, Season 4, Episodes 6 and 7, Up a Lazy River, Parts 1 and 2. And finally, Parks and Recreation, or Parks and Rec, as it's affectionately known, Season 3, Episode 8, Camping. Yeah, so the Partridge family... I'm going to say, I don't think I've ever seen a second of the Partridge family. I really? knew about it, but where I grew up, it was a Brady Bunch station all the way. <laughs> I came to realize my biggest point of familiarity is the theme song from the Partridge family was used in this like porn compilation that I used to watch <laughs> a lot, like in my 20s or something. Uh, like back when you would like Come on, get happy. Is yeah. That what it is? Yeah. Uh, you know, back when you would like download porn videos and kind of keep them for a little while, there was this montage set to that song in this sort of ironic way, I guess. And I immediately flashed back to that when this started. That is hilarious. 
So I came to the Partridge family in a much more innocent way, and that is through Shirley Jones. As we have already established on the pod, I am a huge musical theater fan, and Shirley Jones was Laurie in the movie of Oklahoma. And so I watched that. That was one of those VHS tapes that I wore out when I was a kid. So love Oklahoma, loved Shirley Jones. And then I saw, you know, my mom or somebody was like, oh, you know, she did a TV show, the, the Partridge Family. It's like the Brady Bunch, you know, they're, but they're musical. And I was like, what? Oh. So... I found it, I think, on like TV or um, Nick at Night or you yeah. know something on Nickelodeon. You know when they were uh, showing those old shows, and I I can't say that I watched a ton of them because, like you said, it, it was not easy to find before streaming. But I thought David Cassidy, except for his hair, was super hot, was totally into him. And I loved the fact that they were singing. And so I got into like this and the monkeys kind of around sure. the same time. Yeah, I could see that. that. David Cassidy definitely has a similar vibe. Let's just say top to bottom, this is a super hot family. Yes. This, this, except for Danny some, Bonaduce. <laughs> these are some good looking kids. All right. Uh, yeah. Not to be a total creeper about it, but the, the teenage daughter is definitely a good sort of rival for Maureen McCormick. If yeah. I was a teenager in the seventies, I would absolutely, this would be like my, the way, you know, Tiffany Amber Thiessen and Nicole Eggert were like my two crushes when I was a kid. I could totally see being into, you know, uh, Susan Day. Yeah, Susan Day and Maureen McCormick. I really, I like that 60s flat hair, uh, but all of them, the mom is hot, the the guy with his weird mullet, even the, the <laughs> younger brother, the redheaded kid that's a little more funny looking is still like, I kind of like his vibe. I think this might be one of those things, you know, how some people are like the GoBots are actually better than the Transformers or something. Hey, I like the GoBots. Yeah, to me, I'm kind of like, is the Partridge family like much better than the Brady Bunch? I'll tell you one thing. The Brady Bunch theme sequence, iconic as it is, I really like this sort of psychedelic, uh, like kind of three color, you know, almost like Sal Bass-esque uh, Partridge Family opening with the little cartoon partridges. Yeah, and, it looks like a Mondrian painting. Yeah, or like a James Bond sequence. Oh, or yeah, because the animation uh, of it. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I really liked the sort of overall aesthetic of this. Yeah, like, well, so the bus to me kind of looks Mondrian, but I realize you're talking now about the partridges in the, like the animated open. Yeah, that's kind of cute. So all of this that the Partridge family is, is established in the pilot episode. So there's five kids and a mom, and you've got David Cassidy is the oldest kid, and then um, Lori, played by Susan Day, she's the next oldest. They're like teenagers. Then you have Danny Bonaducci, who's like around 10 to 12-ish. Kind of like the Brady Bunch breakdown. Mm -hmm. You get a couple older kids, a couple middle ones, a couple, and uh, maybe you only get one ones. middle one in this case, yeah. but but same thing, right. little yeah. ones. And the then whole you got scam. the little ones, exactly. So you, and then you have the two littles, and I don't ever remember their names. And in this episode in particular, they're like, they're sent off to their grandparents. So they're not even they're around. entities, but I want to talk about them briefly because they, it opens with a musical number, as I imagine the show often does, because that's the premise, right. as I assume you're about to tell us, is that they're a band. These little kids are so little, they lack the strength, I think, to actually make audible impact with the instruments they're playing. <laughs> like the one, they have the little boy be the drummer right. for some reason, which is so, like you think of the drummer is is the brute of the band. He's the tough guy of this little kid. He's like six. And there's <laughs> no way that the sound that we're hearing on this like down the middle pop song that just sounds like a normal drummer is somehow being played by this five-year-old kid that can barely hold the sticks. Yes, it is very funny to see him like try to do it. And so that's one of the things in the show, right? So the only person originally um, who sang was Shirley Jones. Um, her husband, who is David Cassidy's father, was the like creator uh, of one of the producers, I think, and the creator of the show. And she was the only one that was ever meant to sing. And so in the pilot episode, they are, you know, Know, kind of like this musical family. And then Danny Bonaducci's character, he goes and finds them a manager so that they can like become 
a band, a real band, and c- they convince the mom to like get this bus and go on tour. And so that's why the beginning of every episode, or at least at one point in every episode, there's some musical number because that's the premise of the show. Yeah. And you gotta, you can see this give and take between this and the Brady Bunch, right? Not right. knowing exactly how the timing lines up. You just got to think, oh, because the Brady Bunch had that element too, but it wasn't as front and center. So maybe that was them biting off the Partridge family, but the Partridge family kind of seems in a more general sense to be sort of biting off the Brady Bunch. It doesn't have the same mixed family thing exactly, but it's it's still kind of the same vibe, a bunch of kids of different ages in a house, you know? So this episode in particular is all about the daughter and the mom decide to go camping. The episode opens with that musical number, and then we are in their house, and they have the weekend off. They're home. They're not on tour that weekend, and it's um, and the two littles are going off to the grandparents. So Lori says to Shirley Jones, the mom, you know, you, you should take some time for yourself. Like, you're always around us. Like, you're always just here. You should go off and have an adventure. And the mom was like, you know... I'd really, why don't we just do something just us girls? What about, you know, why don't we just go camping? And she was like, oh, okay, let's do that. And they seemed to have like not a lot of experience and didn't know really anything about what they were doing, but they had all the gear in the garage. So they grabbed the like girl ranger guidebook and then packed up all their gear and off they went. Yeah. And we get our first taste of what's going to be a recurring theme across these episodes. Um, Gender roles, right? Some pretty outdated stereotypes about what, uh, how women can handle the great outdoors, right? Because once Keith and the little brother hear about this, they're immediately bravely concerned, right? They're like, women cannot survive in the wilderness unsupervised. I even, I wrote down uh, one of their concerns is, uh, and I quote, what if you meet a bear? So their whole thing is just like, (laughs) you need male supervision. And they find this ridiculous, right? The the mom and the daughter are like, that's, we're fine. We've got our Girl Ranger guidebook. Like, we'll figure it out. We'll be fine. And like, we're going to see in all of these episodes, all of this bravado is what gets these dumb dudes in trouble in the end. So their solution basically is to follow them surreptitiously. Right. right. So Danny calls their manager, Mr. Something, and says, hey, the the girls are trying to go on a trip. They're going to go camping. And he's like, why did you let them do that? We got to, you know, we got to make sure they're okay. And then he shows up in a suit and Danny and Heath pack like suitcases Keith brings a guitar yeah. and off they go into the woods thinking they're just going to follow them on this camping trip, but they don't have any of their own camping gear. Yeah. They're like, we just have to be here for protection. Right. They're basically, yeah, they're so concerned with the incompetence of the women that they're not actually thinking about what they would need as camping necessities. Right. And I did write down, I thought it was a genuinely funny line when the guy asks uh, David Cassidy, why did you bring a guitar? And he goes, I don't know, force of habit, I guess. <laughs> you know, like he just brings his guitar everywhere. Well, and I, I did like that scene, though, where you had the, the three guys guys, they had found, you know, the mom and the daughter at their campsite and they were kind of peeking through the bushes and they'd been going through the brush all day following them, not wanting to be on the trail because they were worried that they would be seen if the mom and daughter turned around, they would be seen on the trail. So they've been like bushwhacking through. And now the family lives, according to their, like, again, this pilot episode, they lived 40 miles outside of Napa. So this is California brush. There's mountain lions and they do meet a coyotes bear. and bears and snakes. And they're just like bushwhacking through this following these women. And I, it was, I was, it was crazy to me. I'm like, how, why would you think you could just like go out there in your jeans and the manager guy goes out in a suit? But anyway, there's a funny scene after that where they sit down, the girls have settled down for the night and they're like, okay, great. Now let's eat. Yeah, let's eat. All right. And then they're all looking at each other and they realize, oh, we don't have any 
food. Okay, well, that's all right. Let's just, we'll just go to bed. We'll, you know, one night without supper. It's fine. We'll be fine. Get out the bed rolls. Wait, did you bring the... No, the girls have the bed rolls. And they just like have this moment where there's like three different things that they realize that they don't have. There's nothing they can do. So then the manager guy, they realize they don't have any blankets. They don't have anything to keep them warm. It's going to get cold overnight. They haven't eaten anything. So the manager guy takes out his suits and gives his other suits to the two kids. So then the they're wearing these like oversized suits as they go scrambling into the Carol's campground to try and steal food from them because they're so hungry. Yeah, and I just want to check in with the live studio audience multicam versus real world thing, because I'm realizing more and more as we do the podcast and we watch the shows, this is a thing for me. And these older shows that shoot out in the real world and add the canned laughter, it's such a fundamental difference. And this was one where you could tell from the start, the first scene is like in some bar or tavern or something where they're performing their song. Then they're in a normal living room for a couple scenes. And then they're out on the streets. And then they're in, when they're camping, I actually think it's a combination of some parts are a set and some parts they're really out in the woods. But yeah, I'm just realizing more and more that for me, part of the recipe of a good sitcom is it should be in front of a live audience. And that immediacy of hearing the people react to it versus hearing the Flintstones laughter added to these outdoor scenes, there's a cognitive dissonance. It's not just that the laughter sounds fake, it's that my eye sees what I'm seeing. It's going, there's no way an audience could be watching this. They're they're on a river, you know, or they're out on a street. That's And it's so funny that you always focus on that because I don't think of it as an audience is watching. I just think of it as like, oh, there's laughter because this is supposed to be funny. Like I'm laughing right now. This is an indicator from the writers and the studio that like it's supposed to be funny right now. And the other thing to think about is that because these episodes are camping episodes, we're going to have that even though some of these shows are that traditional sitcom studio thing because of the premise and the trope that we're dealing with, You've got sitcoms that have never been outside. They're going outside well, but see, for this. We'll get to it when we talk about Perfect Strangers. I would argue for me, that's what I'm realizing is I prefer the much less convincing approach where you do still have it in front of an audience versus, yeah, actually going out into the wild and having that part be real, but listening to this dumb canned laughter. It's just a different thing. If it's a movie, then it's a movie. To me, the fun of a sitcom is that it's a little play. And that when Kramer does that weird thing, you hear that one person go, ah, in the audience, you know, (laughs) yeah, that's just something I'm sort of discovering more and more. And that these older ones in the 60s and 70s are when you really see that very sort of scattered hybrid approach. You know, it's just something I'm noticing. But anyway, so in terms of the episode, it sort of plays out, you know, that the boys eventually get discovered, right? Yeah, they have to call for help because... The girls get up the next morning and go are gone before they wake up. And then the boys wake up and Danny starts leaving pieces of clothing, shorts, a sock, a handkerchief, hung on branches as they're going around trying to like find the girls because they don't know where they are. And then I guess they do finally see them. But then the women start finding these pieces of clothing because the, you know, the trail sort of winds through and these guys aren't on the trail. They're kind of cutting all through wherever. So they start finding, and the mom knows this is her son's short. These are her son's shorts. So they know they're being followed. They know what's going on. And then eventually the guys give up and they just start calling for help because they're exhausted. They're tired. The manager guy keeps getting hurt. He has like, he falls off a cliff at one point and has like a bandage around his head. He falls, he like trips over some branches and like falls on his wrist. And so he's got his arm in a sling. Like he just keeps getting hurt. And so they're like, all right, we're calling it. We have to call for help. So they scream help and the girls come over and they're unsurprised. And then we see up on the top of a ridge, a girl 
scout ranger guide yeah. troop. And they're like, did somebody call for help? Can we help? And then the mom's like, oh, yeah, we had breakfast with them this morning. <laughs> there's yeah. a there's a there's a camp just around like just, you know, 20 meters that way or whatever. And the, and the guys were like, what? Well, I think that's sort of a mini trope within this camping trope is that idea of you think that you're way out in the wilderness and you're completely like beyond civilization. And then, ha ha, you're five feet away from a 7-Eleven. Something, something, yeah, from actual civilization. So the boys call for help. The women come to help them. They laugh at them. Episode done. Yeah. I have to say, just again, aesthetics wise, I really like this. This is just a fun time capsule kind of thing for me. Lots of olive green and yellow in the clothes and the decor and everything. The family, they're all just beautiful people. Like the whole thing, it's sitcom-y, it's goofy. It's sexist, even in that way of like, we're trying to be modern and it's still kind of sexist. But yeah, I it, it was fun. It was another one of these, like a straight as an arrow, yes. you're marching through this storyline, you know where it's going the minute it starts and and then it doesn't disappoint. It's just doot, 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 doot. And now it's over and come on, get happy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's move on to Small Wonder. Here we go. Small Wonder. Season one, episode 15, Babes in the Woods. Yeah. I remember this show being on. This was a syndicated show. I think it was on Saturday mornings for us. Oh. Um, I don't think this was ever a primetime sitcom, but maybe that it was in makes different sense. markets. That makes sense. I, I don't know this show at all. Okay. I never saw it. I'd never heard of it. I was When we were watching it, I, the only reason I'd heard of it is because some people – particularly when we started doing this podcast, we're like, oh, you know that show, Small Wonder, or like randomly, I, I think maybe people had mentioned, oh, that, you know, the one with the robot from when we were kids. And I'm like, I don't know a thing about it. Usually, I would guess the context in which people are mentioning it is in reference to it being one of the worst television shows of all time. It is just so... Stupid, you know, it's it's that that 80s thing that we were talking about of, oh, what if it's a family plus blank? But it ran for like four seasons. It was on from 85 to 89. And it stars like it. The the recurring characters are kind of heavy hitters. Like we didn't get to see any of them in this episode. But there's um, Edie McClurg is the redheaded neighbor girl's mom. She plays the mom. And then you have, um, what's her name? Alice Ghostly, who plays the Daffy lady on Designing Women. And she was in Mayberry. She was like in Mayberry RFD. She's just, she's Tony Award winning actress, like character actress, right. really well-known character actresses apparently played all the like neighbor characters and busybodies and stuff. Yeah, everybody's got to work. Girl, the girl who played Small Wonder, she was funny. I see. That's where I have to disagree. I, ah, oh boy. Look, in order for this kind of character to work, if you haven't seen the show, the premise is what if a family had a robot for one of their kids? Because the dad's a scientist. He invented a robot. And I have to say, even, you know, we've all seen things where there are these reverse engineered acronyms. Right. right? That's and what this is. In the 80s and 90s, whenever there was a robot character, it would be one of these things. Even for that, this is idiotic. I mean, but WALL-E also, not yeah. 80s and 90s. <laughs> but WALL-E makes a little bit of sense. This is Vicky, V-I-C-I, not the way it's ever spelled, an acronym for Voice Input Child Identicant. I can, just off the top, how about Virtual Intelligence? That doesn't make more sense than voice input. Like, what did you think about this for 10 seconds before you put, you know, started rolling the cameras? It's so silly. The daughter, yeah, she's a robot that the dad invented. They have another kid. And the whole sort of premise of the show is them trying to, you know, get by and keep the secret that the daughter is a robot. And so it's one of these things. She's a character like Spock or Data or something where she's, you know, it's a fish out of water and she doesn't understand anything. And she talks like this because she's a robot. But for that kind of humor to work, there needs to be some spark. 
There needs to be some twinkle of that character that's the robot or the alien or whatever that doesn't understand anything and they're a total square. That actor needs to have a certain something that makes them actually the funniest one of all, even though their character is so deadpan. And this girl did not have that, in my opinion. I totally disagree. Okay, so first of all, the fact that this show was on on Saturday morning makes so much sense because as we're watching this, I was like, there's no way that this was a primetime show. No wonder everyone hates this. This is a kid's show. Absolutely. It's 100% a kid's show. Now that you're telling me it was on Saturday morning, I like it even more. (laughs) This is freaking adorable. And that girl, Tiffany, whatever her name is, Brissette, was funny. She She had that little spark when every time... There would be like, you know, the mom, she was, the mom was asking her to help take a cake out of the oven and she took the cake out of the oven. And then she was like, okay, put it down. And the girl goes, put it down and just drops it. And then of course we have that then happen again a few minutes later when she's cleaned up all the cake. And then the mom goes, oh, I told her to put it down. And she goes, put it down and drops it again. So it happens all over again. And then the little sexy thing where So at the beginning of this episode, the son is supposed to be going on a camping trip with his friend, like a neighbor boy, and it gets canceled. And so, but before it gets canceled, the parents are like, oh, we're going to have a weekend alone. We haven't had a weekend alone since we had Jamie, their son. So let's let's get let's do a weekend getaway let's go go away together and they have this little like kind of intimate moment where they're like oh yeah it'll be a second honeymoon Ooh, and the mom goes and then bites the dad on the on like the chin like the jawline being sexy or whatever and then for the rest of the episode the robot girl has like several opportunities where she says, because it's a, what did she say? A second honeymoon. Rawr. It's so cute. She's adorable. Look, I'm not going to blame the actress. I think she's fine. For me, you know, I think we might have to agree to disagree if you think she's like really good. She's but- really good. But like, if I'm going to hold this to like a uh, Zoe 101 or some of these other crappy kids TV shows that you can watch on Nickelodeon or whatever. Like it's no iCarly. iCarly is in a class to its to itself. But she's funny. I would hold this up against Saved by the Bell and their shenanigans. Yeah, it's a it's a tough comparison. You're right. Like that's the kind of thing we should be comparing this to. We should absolutely be grading on a curve and understand this was not meant to be watched alongside Ally McBeal or something. Absolutely but, not. Or even Kate and Ally. But, but that said, yeah, I remember being a kid and watching this in real time and just going like No, this is lame. Like, I think for me, there's something about, you know, if the formula is going to be that she takes things too literally and she doesn't understand, that's fine. You need a little more than that. Like, you just need a little bit more specificity, a little bit more inspiration in the jokes to have her just go, you said, put it down. So I put it down. It's just like, you, you got to give me something else. Well, and she, but that's the thing. She doesn't explain her own jokes. The family explains it for her. She is the straight man. And what was funny in this episode was that the dad had a line at one point where he's like, there's not a straight man left in America. Meaning like comedians that are the straight man. And I was like, that's so weird because like you guys all suck. (laughs) And I'm going to be like to to agree with you on a certain uh, on a certain level. The rest of the family sucks. Like they're not funny. They're awkward together. There's like zero chemistry like the the kids the two like the Jamie the boy and then his friend Jamie had a few little like funny faces when he was when they um so the camping trip gets canceled everyone assumes that the boys are upset but really the boys are happy because the friend's dad just uses camping to try to show how macho he is and it always ends up a disaster and they don't want to go well so then the parents come in Jamie's parents like the main parents they come in and and they say hey we know you're bummed about not going camping so we decided we'd all go camping and they're like oh god and my dad's cooking and so they're trying to like fake these smiles to not disappoint 
the parents because the parents are so excited about giving them this thing. And the kids do a good job with that, but that is the only other time where I thought that there was a little bit of something kind of maybe funny about it because the rest of it, like the, the humans in the show suck. The whole thing has this bargain basement quality to it. I felt like the boy, like you're saying, is very cute in this like Sears catalog kind of way where it's like, yeah, he's a cute kid. It can't be that hard to find a kid that looks like that. Like they did not go the extra mile to also find a kid that has comic timing that might grow up to be the next, you know, See, and I think differently. I think they didn't go the extra mile to find writers that knew how to write. Well, I think comedy, not disagreeing with that. I think it goes all around. I made a note when those two kids are talking, the one kid says to his friend, you know, I'll give you a dollar. If you'll come on this camping trip with me, he says, it's going to cost you $2, one to go with you, one for your dad's cooking. A professional TV writer wrote that joke. Like, yep. yeah, th- this is just like subpar on every level. Yep. But all of that aside, the most charming part of this show is 100% the girl who plays the robot. How did this show air for four years with a robot who's aging? Oh, they uh, explained that. Just looking quickly at the Wikipedia, they did they just had some explanation at the beginning of the third season of like, we got her an upgrade. She has you know? boobs now. I mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't think she aged that much. No, it would just be a couple of years. No, she still. A kid. Yeah. A kid is visibly older year by year. I think they just said something like, Oh, we gave her an upgrade. And so she's a couple inches taller and I'm going to make adjustments to her face or whatever. So the camping trip itself, you know, we get the usual shenanigans, right? Right. So they are, they get lost when they're, they, I guess, walked over what they say an hour to try and find the campground that they were headed for. And the campground had bathrooms and showers and places to like build a campfire, but they got lost and they didn't find the campground. So they found a clearing. So they were like, well, let's just camp here. And then the boys, uh, only the dad, know, the dad and mom know that they're lost. So the boys go out to get what, like firewood or something. They go on a little firewood hunt and they take Vicky with them. And she says, I smell chili dogs. And they're like, what? That's, you know, you're ridiculous, whatever. And then they spot it and there's a zoo nearby with a snack bar. So they're like, yes, we don't have to eat dad's cooking. And they run. Now, my favorite part of this scene was that there was a big rock. And this happened in all of the shows except the Partridge family. There was a big rock in the center of their camping trip. And it is a fake rock because people sit on it, stand on it, jump off of it, and you can hear the hollow boom in the microphones picked up and broadcast out through your television set. So the kids jump off this hollow fake rock and they go running off to get food from the snack bar at the zoo, which is right there nearby, which made me worried that did they accidentally like come through a fence and they were going to get eaten by animals because they're now on zoo property? Oh, they're like in the lion's den. Yeah, I don't know. But it is another example of that trope we were just talking about where we're lost, we're lost. Oh, never mind. We're, we're you know, basically- we're literally in viewing distance of the zoo. The other thing I was thinking of was just from a science fiction point of view, a robot having a keen sense of smell. You know, so many aspects of this, artificial intelligence and everything, we've achieved or even surpassed in real life. But have do we have computers that can smell things? Can't they detect, like, can't, com- can't computers detect like air quality? I, I'm sure they can. I just like, like there are was... sensors that can yes, do that. Absolutely. I just thought that was an interesting choice. There's a lot of strength humor in this. A lot of the gags around Vicky revolve around her being super strong. So right. she effortlessly lifts a refrigerator or a tree or whatever. I would find it easier to swallow if you had her hear something or see something that was far away. I don't know. I just never thought about robots being able to smell. Well, and that is the other thing, right? If you have a robot that is able to learn, right? Like that's the reason given in the pilot that she comes home with the family and is living with them is because he wants her to become a more advanced 
thing before she goes to market or whatever. Yes. So if she can learn why you're not lost. You have a GPS. Yeah. No, she sucks as a robot. Like it's just funny in the modern age of artificial intelligence and where a lot of this stuff is very real. And yeah, it might not be a little girl that looks like a real life girl, but the idea that a computer understands directions and you can talk to it and interact with it is absolutely a reality. And it's just so funny how whatever it's a sitcom it's it's a joke you know I, I don't mean to come off like i'm not even grasping that the whole thing is just goofy <laughs> but the idea that it's such a sophisticated computer and robot that it looks just like a person and can walk around and yet it is incapable of understanding idioms and colloquialisms and you know like to your point it's not learning anything in terms of the way people communicate and it's actually a liability instead of an asset to have around right because that is a long running gag in the show that she repeats things that she's you know out of context and it makes like it's like it's like a parrot you know what i mean like a parrot doing the repeating well, racist things and you're like what what what's going I, on with this parrot i also was thinking we've got a weird like black mirror ethics situation right off the bat when the dad comes home and the mom is going to clean up the cake and he's like, no, let Vicky clean it up. Vicky, clean up the cake. And then starts making out with the mom. And it wasn't clear to me if the dad was going just like he would with a normal kid, let her clean it up because she made the mess. Or if he's saying, she's a robot, that's why we have her, let her clean it, you know, because yeah, he doesn't I totally, ask her nicely. No, I totally took it as like, as like she's, you know, the Jetsons housekeeping robot. But that's weird as hell when the whole premise of the show is that they're trying to pass her off as their adopted daughter and the general vibe i get is that they do tend to treat her as a child as opposed to like rosie from the jetsons where she's a maid and she is clearly a resource for them yeah well that's true because when the mom's with her in just a moment before that and maybe that's just the difference between like the inventor that made her and the mom who's like home and kind of raising her or whatever. But yeah, the mom was like, oh, you're making, you know, you're making your first cake. Isn't that so exciting? Now it goes in the oven. So it, she's trying to have more of like a, a familial moment, like you're describing. And then the dad's just like, whatever, she's, you know, she's a hunk yeah. of junk. Make Rotate her my tires, Vicky. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that that's pretty much it. You know, all's well that ends well, right? They yeah, find their the way. The next day, they hear things kind of early in the morning, middle of the night. They hear this like growl, and then Vicky gets to make her uh, second honeymoon rawr, joke again, or it could be a mountain lion. She says, and then they hear a uh, oh, monkeys. They hear monkeys, and then they hear an elephant, and. They're like, what is going on? Like, where are these sounds coming from? And then Vicky says, oh, it's from that zoo where the boys ate last night. We don't get an actual bear in this one. We get that in two of our shows. But yeah, look, Small Wonder was one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast. Like, I absolutely have love in my heart for these super goofy 80s artifacts. So I don't want to come across as a total, you know, Grinch about it. But yeah, the show is dumb as hell. <laughs> I think it's dumb as hell in the way that children's TV is dumb. Okay, so much for Small Wonder. Let's move on to Perfect Strangers. Perfect Strangers. We're watching Season 4, Episode 6 and 7, Up a Lazy River, Parts 1 and 2. I love Perfect Strangers. Yeah, you know, I think I might be a little bit of a convert on this one. I went into this with a little bit of prejudice. I didn't watch this as a kid, even though this was one that we sort of had to try not to watch because yeah, it was, it was part on of TGIF. TGIF. It was like an original anchor, like before there was even really a I know. TGIF. This was a big one. And for me, this has come up other times with stuff like Night Court. It was a tough sell for me if there weren't kids. I didn't really like shows that were all grown ups. So that was one thing. And the second thing, which I definitely do not hold this opinion anymore, but these two guys just did not appeal to me. The goofy accent, the other one with the curly hair, I was just like, no, thank you. 
I don't need to see these two grown up men doing goofy voices and tying each other's shoes together or whatever. Like it just was not my thing. Tonight, wow, this was like a breath of fresh air. I I liked this a lot. Yeah. So Bronson Pinchot, I think, is amazing. He's such a good actor. He's so funny. My kind of come around on this was I liked this when I was a kid. I remember thinking he was very funny. I remember thinking Larry was an idiot. He reminded me of Paul Reiser. And I was like, yeah, well, whatever. Like that guy's neither here nor there. But Valky is hilarious. And the shenanigans that they got into were pretty funny. I remember liking the show as a kid. But I never thought either of these guys were attractive. Holy hell. You only watched shows with kids. I was only attracted to people my age. Now that I am older, Bronson Pinchot, way to go, buddy. Second line in my notes, Bronson Pinchot is a snack. All (laughs) caps. He looks really good in this. This is season four. And you can tell, because I kind of remember this even watching it as a kid in the commercials and stuff. He has, he's had the glow up and his hair is in that, uh, that late eighties, early nineties way Quaff. and yeah and he yeah he looks really good he looks vaguely ethnic quote unquote because he's got kind of a big nose but he he's amazing looking he's really handsome but let's set that aside what do we think in the year 2023 of the character of Balky and his weird vaguely eastern european you know sort of second generation robin williams uh voice yeah i mean i don't know i i would liken it more to the andy kaufman um latka from taxi Mm -hmm. yeah and i think so to me yes he's got this sort of like can't place it Eastern European kind of accent, but the way he talks about being from an island, it's more like Greece. And I, I, so like, I kind of get the idea that it's more Greek. And when I was reading about Bronson Pinchot in preparation for today, I read that he had said no to this character. So he was in Beverly Hills Cop, and ha- and did a character where he did a funny accent. The producers of this saw that, and apparently he stole the scene that he was in. And it was like him and Eddie Murphy, and he was funnier than Eddie Murphy. And so people thought that the producers of this were like, we need to get that guy for this role. It's going to be hilarious. And at that point, they had Louis Anderson playing the Larry role. But he said, no, Bronson Pinchot turned it down and said, no, it's exactly the same character as I just played. Like, I'm not going to do that. I want to do something different. And so he said, no, not going to do it. And went and did a pilot and a series with Gina Davis that got canceled after a couple episodes or didn't get picked up or something. So then he was free and he went to go to he went to Greece for a visit and just fell in love with the his quote was like the kindness and the and the openness of the people there and so he was like i i'm going to do it but i'm going to do it like mipos is going to be kind of like vaguely greek and i'm going to show the generosity of the people that i met when i was in greece what do i think about the sort of vaguely uh racist thing i think you know <laughs> Uh, another one of Bronson Pinchot's things was that when he first graduated from Yale Drama, he wasn't going to do accents. He was because he knew he looked vaguely ethnic and wasn't going wasn't going to do it and then made a career out of it. So that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do we take this as this is an ethnicity that he potentially is? So this is like, you know, if Aquafina is playing an Asian person. And so she pretends to have an accent that she doesn't have, but it's sort of like her channeling her own ethnicity. Or is it like he just made up a crazy funny voice and this is just a silly thing he's doing that's completely disconnected from any real identity? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is the same kind of conundrum we get into with the Bora thing, right? There are definitely people who are from... Eastern European countries, particularly Kazakhstan, who find that very offensive. And 
And yet it's, you know, assumed kind of the world over for the, you know, the Western world over as being very funny and, the, and you know, the height of political satire and humor and things. So I think, I think they do it in such a way where it is, it's not making fun of like uh, Balgi isn't the butt of jokes, Larry is. And so even though he's the quote unquote, like simpleton who Larry's trying to like show the ropes, it's, he's not he's not the butt of the joke. Like he's yeah. not the village idiot. He's the one that kind of knows what's going on. Larry is the bumbling dumbass. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, I think for the most part, it's a harmless enough endeavor that I don't think it's worth getting uh, outraged about, but it does have that thing again. Like I said, the Robin Williams sort of vibe of in the eighties and nineties, it's funny that people from other places talk weird you know and even though you're right his character is generally the more competent one it does still smack a little bit of that you know foreign people are funny oh, immigrants absolutely. are funny and when i was a kid that's what i thought like that it was funny to me because he was doing a funny voice and it was and yeah absolutely like he was hilarious yeah so you know just worth contemplating but this episode starts with Harriet from Family Matters. She's their elevator lady. Uh, and yeah, like I said, this whole show has a nice sort of pleasant look to it. Uh, I immediately took to Larry. And this was where I was, I was just pleasantly surprised. Like I said, I hadn't thought about this actor much. I love him in Noises Off. And oh, that's right. He is in Noises Off. Yeah, yeah, he's funny in that. He shows up in Succession. Like he's, you know, he's popped up here and there. But I would say 99 out of 100 people are going to say I associate him with Perfect Strangers. What I appreciated about him now, if I'm always sort of tracking this thing of the more strapping leading men in the older stuff and in the late 80s, early 90s, we started getting the more nebbishy guys like your Harry Andersons. This guy, he has his own vibe. He's able to be very put upon and low status, but still doesn't come across as nerdy or annoying, or he, he's not like a corp in the way that some of those other guys can be. He's just got his own, his own kind of thing. You know, I don't know what his history is, but I could totally see him being a theater guy because he's he's one of those guys where it's like, even though I'm being a total tool and I'm kind of coming across as, uh, like I said, very low status in this situation, you still get the sense, oh, this guy knows what he's doing with his voice. And he's actually a good looking guy, sort of in spite of how he's he's being presented. Playing himself, yeah. Yeah. And I just, I was I was impressed with him. Yeah, well, and as you should be, both of these actors graduated from Yale Drama. They both have a BA and a Master of Fine Arts from Yale Drama. So what's their reason for camping in this? They're, it's a company camping trip and everybody's going. That's why Harriet's there. She says to Balky, like, oh, are you coming on the company camping trip? And he's he's laughing because he's like, there's no way we're going to get my, you know, indoor boy cousin to do a camping trip. And then Larry comes around the corner and he's like, you know why we're going camping? Because girls like manly men and we're going to show Jennifer, his girlfriend, how manly of a man I am because last time I tried to do something like a big trip outdoorsy thing with her, it went poorly. Yeah. So that's what is at the heart of this story is their two girlfriends or like prospective girlfriends coming with them. We get more of those gender roles, right? Because there's a whole scene where Larry is explaining to Balky, he goes, it would be one thing if it was you and I going on this camping trip, but we're bringing women, right? And roughing it does not make women feel romantic. Comfort does, right? So he has this whole sort of agenda of how to make the camping trip more comfortable for the women. Right. He goes to sharper image and buys out the entire camping selection. Uh, we get a little shout out to that kind of in the Parks and Rec episode yeah, as well. Sky Mall and Parks and Rec. That's funny. Um, but so he has Coleman everything 
put up in his living room and Balky comes home and he is like, what is all this stuff? Because the agreement that they've come to is that uh, Jennifer has hesitation. Like she doesn't want to go on this camping trip because when they went skiing, they got caught in an avalanche and they had to be rescued. And she's like, I'm not going in the wilderness with you. And this very much feels like a sweeps episode. You know, it's the two, it's, you know, parts one and two, and it wasn't to be continued. It wasn't like aired back to back. So it, and it has, you know, they left the studio. They have all these shots out in the wilderness. There's even whitewater rafting well, and all this later on. So, you know, when you we'll say see. they left the studio, I'm going to challenge you. Someone left the I studio. I mean, the camera crew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because the white water rafting left the studio and appeared on camera, not <laughs> these four individuals. No, they they definitely when we have the white water rafting sequences, we have some yeah. very fun people who know yeah. how to white water raft in wigs. Yeah, no, we we've got a whole master class in stunts and movie trickery uh, later on. But yeah, it's it's all setting up that Larry wants to be in charge, but Balky is the camping leader. Right. Because Jennifer's like, I'm not going to go if you're the one in charge. You are, like you're saying, this like indoor nebbishy guy. Like you are not, you know, the outdoor guide. That's not you, Larry. And he's not having it. He's like, nope, I am the manliest of men. I am getting all of this Coleman stuff. There's a stove and a tent. And we've got this awesome sleeping bag, which, by the way, is the exact same sleeping bag that the dad from Small Wonder got caught in and the zipper wouldn't open either. Right. It's the blue um, like with the full hood, body. full body. Yeah. It's got a little hood. And the zipper comes right up to like your chin on, if you're looking at the TV screen, the left-hand side. It was the exact same sleeping bag bag in both episodes. Right. Well, and what we sort of realize is that obviously this episode exists because someone saw that sleeping bag and said, I have a funny idea. But Perfect Strangers did it better because oh. they had this whole argument about whether or not two people could fit in the sleeping bag and Balky's in it and he's and Larry's like, no, the guy who sold it to me said you can fit in the sleep. Like two people can fit in the sleeping bag. That's why it's, you know, it's rated for that. Look, and he gets in and they zip themselves up and now they're stuck in the sleeping bag together. And hilarity ensues. Yes, it's very much a sight gag that would obviously be in the commercials. And what I'm starting to realize is I think this was probably the formula and the sensibility of Perfect Strangers and maybe part of the reason why it was not beloved in my, you know, oh so sophisticated household is that <laughs> they like these sort of old timey slapstick things of what can we do to get these two into a situation where they are physically overwhelmed or encapsulated or something. And so, yeah. This, because it is a two-parter, you know, most of this first episode is given over to the preparation and the whole centerpiece is this slapstick gag of the two of them being in this, you know, what's basically a one-person sleeping bag. And then the girlfriends show up. Well, the phone rings. Yeah. So we get, uh, remember in the I Love Lucy yes. episode yes. where where they had the tape down the middle of the room and Lucy had the receiver on her end and the or the talking part on her end and um, what's Desi. his name? Desi had the listening part on his end yeah. or whatever. We get the same kind of thing because Balky picks up the phone with his from by the cord with his teeth and kind of like gets it back into the sleeping bag so that like one can hear and one yeah. can talk and they're like he's like Hello. yeah you he talk I'll listen. yeah it's the same gag yeah it's very funny and then the girlfriend shows up and they have to just sort of Lop themselves down onto this, you know, inflatable bed thing. Well, they had fallen over. So they were, they were, they hung up the phone and the phone doesn't hang up all the way. And I'm sure that this was something they improvised. Like they didn't get the phone hung up right. They kind of look at each other and they go, good enough. Super cute. And then they, the only way they can get around now is hopping. Yeah. So then the, somebody knocks on the door and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And they start hopping, but they're like not together and they trip and they fall face down on that, this big air mattress that he's blown up in the middle of the living room. 
And the girls walk in and they're face down on the air mattress trying to like inchworm to get yeah, themselves they're like rolled gaining over. gaining momentum by like, yeah, sort of wobbling back and forth until they finally have the force to flip themselves over. Yeah, it's really funny. And this is exactly what I mean when I say I need that live audience because that, that's what this whole humor is born out of. It's like when you're in summer camp and you're like, yeah, it'll be funny if we, you know, walk around on our knees in our shoes, or if we have, you know, me lip sync to the other person's voice or something, just like these gags that just, if you're there in the moment, the studio audience just eats them up. And there's this, this chaotic energy that's just really fun. And that's, and that's exactly what this was. And we see several times that, that uh, throughout both of these episodes, that if they don't have anything else, they resort to the two of them getting in an argument and one of them throttling the other one and shaking them back and forth so that their head bobs around. Yeah. So then the girlfriend leaves and uh, they're still in the sleeping bag together. Larry goes to Balky. You don't think she noticed anything wrong, do you? And he goes, no, she probably sees two men in a sleeping bag each and every day. (laughs) Great capper to that scene yeah at this point i'm on board like i'm i'm like i don't know what my family was thinking perfect strangers is good it's very funny and then we get the to be continued right no we get the beginning of the camping trip that's right we get the sort of squabbling larry's got an agenda this whole time he's like i'm giving the illusion of ceding control to balky but i want to make all the decisions and run the show right and so they have a guide that's like leading the rest of the office toward the campsite. And they say that they need to go down this little hill to get to where the mules are because the mules are going to carry all of their stuff so they can get down to the campsite. And there's a, a raft like rental station right there as well. And Larry decides not to follow the rest of the office and the guide and says, no, no, what we need to do is we need to rent this raft because it'll be so nice. And I've got all my, you know, I've got all this gear. We can have our nice picnic dinner and we can float down the river and we'll just, it'll be so peaceful. We'll just float right up to the campsite. Who needs a mule? Did you see the girl's faces when they mentioned mule? It's more of this gender roles bullshit of, did you see how the women reacted when he said mule? And, you know, of course, Balky's like, not really. I think they're didn't Fine. react at all. <laughs> yeah. But so, uh, yeah, Larry insists. He sort of points out, oh, I said you could be the camp leader, but we're not camping yet. We're, we're going to the camp. So your leadership hasn't started yet. So I'm in charge. I'm in charge and we're going to rent this raft. And then I think they thought, I think Larry thought they were just going on a nice, easy, you well, know, lazy river kind of yeah. floating down. But there's a fork in the river. And if you go the one way, you end up on whitewater. And if you go the other way, then apparently it is easy. So the guy who's renting the raft looks like a Thor, in, you know, impersonator. Yeah, he's a hunk. And he says, you know, do you need a guide? And he scoffs, you know, Larry scoffs at that and says no, and then has to convince Balky that they don't need a guide and gets the raft and no guide. And the four of them get in and they have a lovely journey at first. A lovely rear projection and or green screen uh, raft ride. To me, it looked a lot like rear projection in these earlier parts. If you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, there's this part that's famously this like really obvious rear projection sequence in this river raft thing. And this was 10 times, you know, less realistic than that. But it was very much... uh, no, we're gonna we're gonna keep the wilderness aspect of this fake so we can have the audience aspect of it real. And we don't we don't wanna leave our set and go out into the world. We wanna just, you know, put it put down some bushes and splash some water on you and pretend we're in the ocean. We or are r- on the river. So they get to the fork and Balky is, you know, they're like, oh, well, which way should we go? And um, Balky's like, oh, Mother Nature's telling me we go right. And Larry pulls out a map that doesn't look like a map. It just looks like it has words on it. And he says, well, the map says we have to go left. And he, and Balky's like, but Mother Nature. And he's like, ha, 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 Balky, you're so funny. We're going left. And off they go. And then pretty soon the water starts to churn. 
Yeah. And that's when we get the hilarious stunt doubles. If you remember the part in Spaceballs where they go chasing them down the corridor and they turn around and like the woman's got a mustache and stuff. And it's like, yeah, you only got their their stunt doubles. That's what this is. They yes. keep cutting to wide shots of the of the four of them going down this wild river and it's just obviously completely different people. The women they they kind of looked okay and even Balky's hair, like the stunt double Balky's hair was fine. But for Larry, they decided let's go get a Jackson 5 afro. <laughs> and let's only cut it down a little bit and put it on it. Now, look, The guy who plays Larry has dark curly hair, but it's kind of like flat against his head in a way that's almost like he's balding. And it's like, it is not, he doesn't have the texture of that hair like you do that makes it like puffy and get kind of froey. Yeah, Yeah, it's that thing when you want to be somebody for Halloween and you're like, well, this wig is curly hair and this wig, you know, and you have to kind of make your choices when none of them really looks just like him. But yeah, and then they end up getting sort of, they they have to each abandon the boat, right? One well, by one. You know, there's the white water and they're trying to do it. And then we get those, you know, interspersed with the wide shots. We get like the green screen stuff you're talking about where they're throwing water up in the air. But so the water's splashing and they're getting wet. And then Balky and Larry keep fighting because they're mad at each other. And then I guess Larry falls out and then Balky jumps out to save him. And then the girls just jump out. They're just, you know, like we're, it's- Well, an, they come to realize they're in a waterfall. Yeah, they hear a waterfall, but jumping out wouldn't be like- if you don't want to do that, that's the opposite of what you want to do. But anyway, so they do, they jump out and then that's when we get everybody's kind of floating down the river. And then we see the empty boat going towards the waterfall and we don't see them anymore. And that's the, to be continued. Right. That's the cliffhanger quite literally, but we come back and yeah, they just, they kind of make their way, you know, to the 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 shore. shore They get to the shore. They're soaking wet. They don't know where they are. And uh, it's time for Balky to take his leadership role, right? Right, Where he says his jobs for everybody are, uh, we need one person to hunt for nuts and berries. We need one person to be the firewood committee and one person to dig a good luck hole. To dig for the good luck slug. The good luck slug. Okay. So he's got his own weird leadership techniques, I guess, but that's what they're doing despite the fact that they sort of don't know where they are and there's, you know, there, there's sort of there's still this growing power dynamic between Larry and Balky of like, who's really in charge and what should they do? Right. Because they are in a clearing and Balky contends and the girls agree that they should sit there and wait for the rescue crew because eventually that raft is going to be found. It's going to, you know, fall over the waterfall, float down river. Somebody's going to see it, know that there's people. And so they should stay like right there by near, like near the water in this clearing so that they can be found. And Larry once again pulls Balky aside and is like, look, I, you know, you can't, you can't, you know, I know that I've made these mistakes, but I need, I need to, to be a man here. Like I need you to be on my side and tell the girls to listen to me because I've lost Jennifer's respect. And if I don't get it back, I'm like, that's it for us. Like she's going to break up with me. We're going to drift apart and you're never going to get to, you know, be an uncle and see our kids because I'm going to be alone. And Balky's like, Oh no, I want to, I want to be an uncle, but wait, how could I be an uncle? Cause I'm your cousin. Yeah. Men getting lost is definitely a theme in all this. This is like, I guess, the sort of reverse sexism, whatever you want to call it. It's there's always, you know, that the the men are going to get lost. And well, and it's this thing of like this assumption that all of the men in these episodes have kind of had going in that. I'm a man. So, you know, obviously, like I could just go out to the woods. My ancestors lived in the woods. I can just go out to the woods and I can just do it. And so that bravado leads to a lack of preparing. And whereas the women, not in this episode, because they're just going along for the ride, but in the other episodes, the women are the ones who've done the preparation, right? They're like, oh, I, 
I know what I'm doing. I'm going to prepare to be able to be out in the woods. Yeah. And so Larry's continued incompetence, the whole thing gets worse and worse. And he ends up being a baby, like curled up in the fetal position. Right. And this was another thing that really won me over. I thought he was very funny in this sort of breakdown and just kind of freaked out. Yeah. Just, just kind of making me realize like, okay, this guy, this is just like a classic old timey sitcom character where this guy is like a little kid where there's no self-reflection. Everything is in the moment. Everything is, I want my girlfriend to think I'm tough. So we need to do this. And then, you know, when, when things, when he gets overwhelmed, then he he starts crying. He goes, I can't believe I did this. You know, and he's just, he's sucking his thumb and he's so down on himself and you know everything is just that immediate emotion and there's no like sort of rumination or growth like you said balky is giving out the jobs again to everybody and he's like good news larry you get to be the one who digs for the slug and larry's like nope if you guys aren't going to listen to me and you're not going to convince the girls to listen to me, then I'm going to do it my way. I can't be wrong about everything. And he turns and he walks and whoop, falls into yeah. quicksand. Now, what's the deal with quicksand? Is it real? Is it made up for movies? Have you ever known about any person in the real world ever being enveloped by quicksand. So it has been driving me crazy since we watched this episode because I listened to something or watched something. I it may have been another podcast that that there is like what's the thing that you were told as a kid that you thought was going to happen as an adult and it's quicksand based disasters. Like when we were growing up Everything, every cartoon character, every TV show, every yeah. time you go out in nature, somebody like Gilligan falls in quicksand. Balky and Larry fall in quicksand. Like everybody falls in Bugs Bunny, quicksand, everybody. Yeah, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. So many things. But yet, who has ever, no, no real person has ever found quicksand. Apparently it is an actual thing. But- yeah, I, it must come from somewhere. But I just thought it would, like, it must have been famously used in a movie like some Tarzan movie or some old timey thing and just caught on through the culture you know like you're saying with Bugs Bunny and stuff that Yeah, they kind I mean of spoof- Dr. Livingston, right? Like that is definitely that whole thing. Anyway, so I believe that it is an actual phenomena, but it is very very rare and not anywhere near as um prevalent as m- media or in television and stuff would make you believe. This looks like an episode of Double Dare, right? This is, you know, Balky goes in after him. And again, like I was saying, this this is part of the the DNA of the show, I guess, are these sight gags and these slapstick sequences where the two of them are up to their mouths in what I thought was maybe like Corn meal, it like looks like oatmeal. Yeah, it looks something. like oatmeal or something like that. Yeah, it really does look like the end of Double Dare, where you're just like like splashing around in slop. And uh, yeah, it goes on for a while. It was very funny. The you know the the thing that always happens when you get in quicksand is somebody says, "Wait, just relax, don't move, because that'll keep you from sinking." And they are able to be sort of like surprisingly buoyant in this. Like I I I, I think they probably have their feet on something below them or whatever, and so they're able to sort of like rise up a little bit and then like kind of kneel down and lower themselves down a little little bit. Yeah, I would love to see like the behind the scenes of of a quicksand scene, like how they do that. Because just like in the in the sleeping bag, where all we saw were their little faces and like the front part of their hair. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing. They're literally up to their mouths, like you said, in quicksand and Blunson Pinchot is like spitting it out as he's talking. And it is it's clumpy. It's not sandy like you normally think. Like this is like dirt kind of yeah, quicksand. So it was pretty gross, um, which is what made me think it might be oatmeal, just the way it was like clumping like that. So yeah. So then they have to reach for the 
the stick like Princess Bride and they can't, he can't, Larry can't reach it. So then Balky tries to reach it and then Larry freaks out and dunks him once he realizes that he's got it. And then, and then Balky like pulls him up by his hair and then, and then Larry dunks Balky. So then Larry pulls Balky up by his hair. I mean, it's all very funny. Yeah. It's more slapstick stuff, but they get each other out. They have more, you know, grr, I'm going to scrangle strangle you i'm mad at you you know the group comes back together and overnight we get this sort of variation on the boy who cried wolf type thing right where larry is going to sleep and the rest of them are like we need to give larry some confidence right balky is like the whole point of this was for him to feel like a man and come off like some kind of hero and he's getting everything wrong. So we need to manufacture some sort of fake crisis that he can solve and save us from. And then he'll feel good about himself. Right. So they lost everything when the boat flipped over, except for themselves and their life jackets that they had on. Except Marianne, Balky's girlfriend, somehow still had her eyebrow pencil yeah. because she they've decided that they're going to fake a snake bite that Jennifer's going to get a snake bite and she goes you can use my eyebrow for eyebrow pencil to draw on the bite I was like where did you get that from you keep that in the pocket of your Jordash jeans um so anyway Larry wakes up and hears this plan and he's like no you should have it be on your her leg I think that would be better and they're like yeah yeah leg whoa he found out and he's like, don't try to, you know, make me feel better. And he walks over to another place in the clearing, throws down his life jacket and lays on it and flops down and is like. Meh. Yeah, he's kind of pouting and he's like, oh, uh, you know, don't pity me. But then, of course, a bear shows up. And it's that old joke of the person doesn't realize the danger they're in and they go, oh, so I suppose the monster is right here, you know, and not taking it seriously because they think it's fake. Right. And then, of course, Balky comes wandering back. OK, I got the firewood. And so he realizes, oh, crap, it really is a bear. But he gets exactly what he wanted. I mean, he he gets a legitimate hero moment and he yeah. saves the day. And like I said, I mean, he's just, you know... His lack of self-awareness, his sort of perpetual optimism and striving, like, I just realized that, yeah, this was much more in the vein of those, you know, those sort of classical Sanford and Son type or, uh, you know, honeymooners or whatever, where it's just like a couple of characters and very simple comic types. I like it. I like this whole feel. Yeah, I very much enjoyed Perfect Strangers. I was so looking forward to going back to it, and it did not disappoint. And yay, yay, Bronson Pinchot. Like, you are very funny. All right, let's move on to Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec, we're watching Season 3, Episode 8, Camping. Yeah, like I say every time, when we get to these more recent single-camera shows, it's different. There's all these ongoing stories unfolding. You know, I watched Parks and Rec. I, I like it, you know, that I'll be on record as a, as a you know, as a nope, 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 uh, nope, nope, pro nope fella. I don't know. Um, I like Parks and Rec. But as always, when we mix them in, this kind of show into the lineup, it always is a little odd. Right. I like we first really noticed this, or at least I first really noticed this with Shits Creek, where it was like, oh man, we were watching this kind of like big emotional episode that was such a tearjerker first time around, and then it just didn't land in the same way. This one, not a tearjerker, obviously, but like you said, there's some humor in these shows that is lost when you're not regularly watching them and kind of know where all the characters are in their journey. Even if you, like you said, are a Nope fan and have watched the whole series, it's weird to just sort of jump in in the middle of it. Right. It's not just the humor. It's the whole way you process the story. Right. Because for better or worse, these older ones are like, all right, act one, the guy walks in, I'm too short. I need to find a way to be taller. And that's the story of the episode. Right. With these, it's like, no, we're all in the in the midst of all these ongoing things. And what is Rob Lowe at here? What's he trying to do? And where are Adam Scott and Amy Poehler and their relationship? And yeah. so, yeah, there's all this stuff unfolding. But that said, 
This is a relatively straightforward story. Leslie is, she's basically facing the public official version of writer's block, right? right. She needs a big idea. And her idea, better an idea, is to take everybody on a sort of camping retreat and kind of go back to nature and get the creative juices flowing. So Parks and Rec, they are a Parks and Recreation Department in city government. She's had this great success. And now the mayor's like, can't wait to hear what your next idea is. And then um, puts the city manager, I guess, like in charge of that. But then the city manager has a heart attack. And then that's the reason to bring back Rob Lowe's character. They had they were brought in in like some time in season two, I think, to have they were like some sort of oversight. And now that they've at this point in season three, they've been there for a while. And Adam Scott decided to stay and take on a role in the department, or you know was was left behind. Whereas Rob Lowe's character was going to go back to whatever head office and do whatever. But when the city manager has a heart attack, then they need an interim city manager while he's recovering. So Rob Lowe comes back. I just want to point out quickly the city manager that keels over and gropes her boob. Um, this is a second timer for the sitcom study because he's the president in Veep. And now, so it's like whenever you need an old, bland, white guy to be your your politician or whatever, your head of state, you know, your ineffectual leader, uh, you get this guy. But yeah, Leslie in general, I think this is a real example of what we talk about sometimes with that sort of turn away from the negativity and towards the sort of positive human side of life in the later 2000s, you know, where you get characters like Ted Lasso or Leslie, where uh, it just her whole thing. It's not that she's a boob like Michael Scott. She's really confident and good at her job. Yeah, she's and, super earnest. Yeah. And so the humor stems from her being just sort of being a character, like just being so motivated and having having all these fun little quirks about her. But you just you get this real sort of positivity from this show that yes. I think is sort of makes it in a good way a, a sign of its time. Yeah. She has the the thing, the quality of she makes everybody in her office want to be there. Like she raises morale. She's so positive and she makes things happen and she's just so earnest that it ends up creating this feeling and it even turns Ron around, right? Like his whole thing in the first season is I'm only in city government because uh, I think government is ineffective. So I'm here to make sure it stays ineffective. Like that's his whole thing. Yeah. You know, the crux of this episode is she doesn't have an idea. She wants to come up with an idea. She thinks getting all the team together will start, you know, getting her creative juices flowing, but it doesn't. And none of them really want to go camping. Yeah. The resistance to camping, I think, is, is, is part of the trope, right? Even though we surprisingly didn't get that much of that in the other ones. I think in general, that's something that that's part of the whole deal is you want some characters going, ah, camping, screw that, you know, and I in this one, be here. yeah, we get a lot of that. We get basically none of them want to be there. Like you said, there's a surliness built into a lot of their characters, you know, so Aubrey Plaza's character and Nick, Offerman's character and Reda's character, like all of them are just kind of like, why are we doing this? What's the deal with this? I have to say, I relate a lot to Leslie's central, her sort of existential crisis. You know, she's a little bit of a, a victim of her own success. And she's like, you know, I, I, I got to where I am because I have good ideas, you know, but that's not something that you can just turn on. And yeah, she's just sort of faced with this dilemma of like, you know, how do you how do you manufacture that sort of spark of inspiration? And uh, I feel for her as she's getting more and more desperate. I did like the line where she's she's going, yeah, I, I was so desperate. I've I've taken to looking through the old dream journals. And <laughs> she looks at one, she goes, I married Alf and we were pretty happy. 
That's the entry in her dream journal. We don't get a ton of actual camping stuff in this. Like we get a little bit of the, you know, the characters are going to have their their own things. We get Nick Offerman is paired up with the big older guy. So they're doing the sort of fly fishing thing. And he's, you know, Jerry's being all personal and intimate and talking about the details of when he lost his virginity and how his daughter wants to be on birth control, but she's only 16. And of course... Nick Offerman's like, you know, what if we don't talk? Like, he's just got that kind of... Nick Offerman by way of Buffalo Bill. (laughs) And then you've got Adam Scott's character, who is not an outdoorsy type at all, and Aziz Ansari's character, who's the same. And then we have the fun little bit where he's like, he's bought out Sky Mall and has completely, like, he's got, you know, a big... He's glamping, basically. He's got this huge setup, the X-Bot. DJ Roomba, which is this ongoing joke that I think is hilarious, is there. And uh, it's a, it's a, if you haven't seen Parks and Rec, DJ Roomba is like a little sort of mini boombox strapped to the top of a Roomba. So the music kind of roams around the room. But it always made me laugh because if you've ever had a Roomba, they're so freaking loud yeah. that you'd ne- like the music would have to be so loud to hear over. Yeah, but he is glamping. He's hooked his electricity into the generator, right? No, the or- the van's battery, Okay, which is what happens because they finally give in. Like Leslie admits to everybody she doesn't have an idea. Cause the- and then Ron's like, look, let's get out of here and goes to start the car and the car won't start. So then they're like, all right, well, we can kind of hoof it and go over to this B&B that's not too far away. And of course, the B&B is like this horror movie, creepy cat lady place. Yeah. Aubrey Plaza uh, doesn't want to wake up for the continental breakfast at 6 a.m. or whatever. Leslie is now, we get another fun cultural reference. She's listening to Steal My Sunshine by Len on repeat because she says, they're a one hit wonder like me. Just like me. <laughs> so yeah, she's she's spiraling. She's listening to Len. Ron comes in and sees her spiraling and he tricks her. He's like, look, you just need to go to sleep. And she's like, absolutely not. That's not what I need to do. I need to do it. And he's like, and he's like, oh, okay, well just step right in here and puts her into the bedroom that has like 50 cats in it. And, um, and then, and he's like, and I'm going to stand out here and guard the door until you get some sleep. And she eventually falls asleep because that's his, his whole point is that, Hey, you you're burnt out. Like you're not going to come up with, with an idea. You're running on fumes. You need to go to sleep. And so she does. And then the next day we're back at the office and she's like, I got sick sleep, which is more than I've ever had. It's like double what I've had in years. And we get this great scene. And the reason it's great is because they are all having a really good time. So one of the things about Parks and Recreation is that there was always like a loose script, but everybody, all the actors were really talented improvisers. So a lot of it was just kind of, you know, they would go wherever they were going to go with it. So she comes running in and she's like, all right, and starts listing off all of these ideas that she very clearly is improvising because every shot we get of Rob Lowe and Adam Scott, they are eyes big and happy and big grins on their face. You can tell that they like just stopped laughing. So they just have like one shot of them smiling. It's like, it really is such a great moment because you can tell they're having fun. Yeah, that's part of it. But I think within the world of the show, it's also they're beaming at her because it's like, yeah, and she said she wasn't going to have an idea, you know, like she, I forget the specifics of her idea. It's like an event that's sort of like an antiques roadshow, but it's going to benefit the city. And there's all, she has all of these things that are like, even though they're kind of like quirky and funny, like they're actually good. And you're right. you're supposed to take it as like, yeah, they're sitting there watching her going like, yeah, you know, yeah, you had it in you the whole time. You know, this is who you are. She has just rattled off 17 different random big ideas. Um, she says one and Rob Lowe goes to speak up to be like, oh, that sounds great. Let's get on. And then she just keeps going. And it's uh, I wish I want to see the outtake. Like we got to go find the outtakes of that scene because I'm sure it was hilarious. Yeah. And so this is one where, again, it's the camping is definitely central to the episode in a lot of ways, but only in so far really as it serves the story of 
Leslie trying to find her idea and having this sort of crisis of competence. And- yeah, I think this is one of the times where the the camping is more of a construct so that we can do something different with everybody other than Leslie. Yeah, we're just at a point now where the sitcoms are less tropey. And so, especially with something like this, yeah, we can come up with a couple gags, but this isn't going to be all about falling in the quicksand and getting trapped in the sleeping bag and, you know, going off the rafting cliff and that kind of stuff. Right. And it definitely has that later 2000s, like you're saying, feel of we... Like, we're too smart for our own damn good with sitcoms now, right? Like, we, the early sitcoms are that straight arrow from, you know, act one, two, three, done. This is what's going on. You know what's going to happen from the beginning, like the opening line, like you said. And then in the 90s and the 80s, you get more of like the, and then there's this, and then there's that. And isn't it funny with this gag? And aren't the, like, we put these in a wacky situation. So you get all these wacky situation kind of things happening. And then in the 2000s, it's more like, we're too smart for that. Nobody wants to see these stupid, wacky situations. They burn Burn too many bridges with shows like Small Wonder. And yeah. <laughs> well, nobody wants to see it anymore. So we're going to have like a real kind of experience where people are camping and most people are complaining and somebody's gone over the top and, you know, and half half the people are just there and quiet eating s'mores because that's what it's like to go camping. Yeah, they're just not as fun to flip to a random episode and watch you know, just for the hell of it. Absolutely. Because you're not getting, you're not getting the slapstick comedy or the, you know, wacky situation or the whatever. Yeah. What you do get is the, the personalities, right? Like Nick Offerman is fun and funny to watch all the time, you know, and I would argue all of these people are fun. Like that's the one thing that you, that you do get no matter what. So yeah, looking back on all of these, I think this is one where, The reason why you do the trope in the sitcom is the same reason why you do it in real life, you know, change of scenery and getting people out of their comfort zones, you know, like to me, this is a very, uh, you know, open and shut case. Like, why wouldn't you do that with, you know, any, any show, right? Just put them out in the wilderness. It's a thing that real people do for no reason other than it's just for its own sake. And it it presents you with all of these challenges. Yeah, like quicksand. Quicksand, bears, right? We get two bear appearances out of these four shows, which I find vindicating because I'm always very scared of bears. Um, and every time we go to Florida, alligators. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say for me, the clear MVP is Perfect Strangers. 100%. Um, like I said, Partridge Family was very fun for the sort of the looks and the costumes and just, you know, all those all those good looking actors and everything. The but, collars. Uh, yeah. The collars alone. Come for the actors, stay for the collars. I agree on most of those, but I am giving an honorable mention to Small Wonder. I thought that girl, Tiffany, whatever her name is, playing the robot was funny. I thought she did a great job making me laugh in that episode when everything else, like the parent actors were awful and the kid actors, there's just, there wasn't enough writing. There wasn't anything there, but the little robot girl, she gets an honorable mention from me. Fair enough. So that closes the case on camping episodes. What are we talking about next time? Next week, we are getting bonked on the head. Look out. I don't know who I am. All of our characters have amnesia and take on an alter ego. The Flintstones, Season 1, Episode 5, Split Personality. Then we'll go to The Addams Family, Season 1, Episode 22, Amnesia in The Addams Family. Gilligan's Island, Season 3, Episode 24, The Second, Ginger Grant. And finally, you've been waiting for it. Charles in Charge is coming to the podcast. Season 4, Episodes 14 and 15, a double episode, Charles splits part one and two we get chats i will be rekindling my relationship with the lady that taught me how to love miss nicole eggert 
All that and more on the next podcast. And until then, we will declare this segment of the sitcom study concluded. Thank you for listening to The Sitcom Study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The Sitcom Study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. Studio dog.